you know, I just can't wrap my head around these people who think the Earth is flat. Like, how does gravity work? Write me an equation for gravity on a flat Earth. I just, I just can't with these people. The Earth and stuff. The Earth and stuff about the Earth and stuff. The Earth and stuff about the Earth and stuff. The Earth and stuff about the Earth and other things. So peeps, I know that last week I promised to review basic chemistry this week, but I'm going to push that until next week because I want to talk a little bit more about the structure of the Earth, something I don't think I covered in great enough detail last week. Now, of course, the Earth is round, and human beings have known this since about 240 BC. But it isn't exactly a perfect sphere. It's an oblate spheroid. Well, let's talk about how we figured that out, do a little history, and then take a brief look at the inside of our planet and its structure. Now imagine, you're a Greek philosopher named Climedes, and you're a librarian, and not just any librarian, you're a librarian at the Library of Alexandria in Egypt, in the year roughly 240 BC. Now this is kind of a crazy time in human history because the Punic Wars are going on, and you know, the Chinese have just made the first observation of Halley's Comet, but you're too busy to deal with any of that. You're a Greek philosopher in Egypt. You notice at noon, on the summer solstice in Sienne, Egypt, the sun is directly overhead. Your shadow is cast straight down, meaning unless you jump, you don't have a shadow. Now, you being a Greek philosopher, of course, you decide to go north to Alexandria exactly one year later to measure the length and angle of the sun's shadow at noon. Now, if you know the length of a rod and the length of the shadow, you have two legs of a triangle, which you can use to calculate the angle of the sun's rays. You do this and you come up with a number of about seven degrees which is approximately 1 50th of a circle. And you know the distance you walked from c &E to Alexandria, and thus you can get a distance and multiply that by 50, and you get the circumference of the Earth. And you're only off by 10% in 240 BC. Now, there are a couple reasons why Cleomedes was off by about 10% in his calculations, but one of those reasons is that the Earth isn't a perfect sphere. So this was an idea that was being debated about a millennium and a half later. And there were two teams of guys from the French Academy of Sciences and they decided to set out to settle this debate once and for all. So they got two teams, one team goes north to the Arctic Circle and the other team goes south to Peru at the equator and they're going to measure as accurately as they can one degree of latitude. You see the Earth is a sphere and it has 360 degrees, right? Uh, but it has 360 degrees in, 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 in all directions and we measure the north-south directions as latitude and we call the east-west directions longitude. So they set out in 1735 to measure one degree of latitude and then they met back in Paris a few years later to compare notes. And they found out that in fact, a degree of latitude was longer at the equator than it was in the Arctic Circle. Now, they were actually just confirming something that Newton had already said, which is that if your planet is a sphere and it's spinning as it forms, then centrifugal force will cause it to bulge in the center, perpendicular to the spin axis. So the Earth isn't a perfect sphere. It has a bulge in the middle. And it's actually a little bit more complicated than that because if you measure gravity very accurately and precisely, like we have, you notice there are small gravity variations on our planet. A positive anomaly would be, uh, would correspond to some mountain range, a place on the Earth that compared to the average has a little bit more mass and thus a little bit more gravity. Conversely, you know, a negative gravity anomaly would be somewhere like an ocean trench where there's, you know, relative to the average, a little less mass and thus a little less gravity. So this gives concept, so this gives concept, this gives concept to the Earth's 
geoid, a hypothetical surface that shows gravity variations compared to the average. It's really useful for a lot of reasons. You almost certainly rely on it in your everyday life. The geoid reference is used in GPS calculations, which help you get to Starbucks. So the Earth is round, but it isn't a perfect sphere. It bulges at the equator, and there are bulges and dents, you know, scattered all around it. But we're talking about variations, uh, you know, on the scale of a few percent, which is significant and has important implications for navigation and surveying and space travel, but it's so subtle that you really don't notice it with the naked eye, even if you observe the Earth from space. So most models just make the Earth round and make it a perfect sphere for the sake of simplicity. So now that we've covered that, which you definitely had to know, let's quickly chat about the basic interior structure of our planet. I mentioned in the previous video that the Earth is made up of layers. And these layers, for the most part, have distinct boundaries. Now, we know this about the Earth so well because of earthquakes. You see, when an earthquake happens anywhere in the world, it releases a ton of energy. Well, the waves of energy travel into the interior of our planet and can even be detected on the other side of our planet. Earthquakes also release a couple different kinds of waves, which propagate at different speeds. As earthquakes travel through the Earth, they are reflected and refracted at major boundaries. So if you put vibration monitors all around the world, you can receive these reflected and refracted waves. If you have enough monitors and enough earthquakes and you make enough observations, then you can begin to build a picture of the interior of our planet, kind of like a CAT scan. Let's start in the middle, the core composed mostly of iron with some nickel. Now, there's a solid inner core and a liquid outer core, and this is extremely important to us. The convection of the liquid outer core around the inner core is what produces the Earth's magnetic field, which helps shield our planet from solar radiation and solar wind. Recall that we've got meteorite samples from iron cores from other planetesimals that have been blown apart by collisions. So the inner core of our planet probably has a very similar texture. Next up from the core, we have the mantle. Now I think a lot of people assume the mantle is liquid magma. Liquid hot magma. But in fact, the mantle is almost entirely solid rock. We'll talk about how to melt this rock in a much later lesson. While solid, the mantle does convect on a geologic time scale, and this is how heat is transported from the hot core to the cooler outside shell of the planet. Finally, the top layer is the crust, where we live and used to watch Game of Thrones, R.I.P. Daenerys. The crust, compared to the mantle and the core, is less dense, and in response to stress, it behaves more brittly than the mantle. Okay, so the Earth is round, but not perfectly, and it's made out of layers with relatively sharp boundaries and each layer has its distinctive temperature, density, chemistry, and mechanical properties. Outer core convection is responsible for our magnetic field, which we like, and the mantle is convecting solid rock that transports heat from the inside to the outside, which in turn drives volcanism and plate tectonics and all of that. So now we're ready to do some light chemistry review next week. And after that, we'll talk about minerals. And at some point, eventually in this course, we'll look at a rock. We've got to. I'm running out of NASA footage. As always, if you have questions, drop them in the comments below. Thanks for watching, peeps. See you next week.